been here, and I'm really just proud that we have reached, uh, reached the, uh, we have really gotten everybody so excited about this event. We've had it several times, and I guess either the word was good or the advertising was better this time, but we keep having more and more people. Um, and to respect your time, I've tried to write a little something here to try and explain the idea behind today, behind the Science Cafe uh, that we started four years ago with GPSS and Pathways to Science. And it begins like this. Does knowledge or science tickle your fancy? Then I think you've come to a good place to start. We are here because you might wonder, what would it be like? What would it be like if I was to step in the shoes of a young scientist? Shoes that I may want to fill one day myself. Not so many years from now. Where would my shoes walk? On the horizon of human knowledge? And what lies there? What rich islands, continents, and oceans await scientific discovery? The horizons that are years and years away from the pages in my textbook today. And who will my quest impact? So we brought some rock star graduate students, as Maria <laughs> likes to call them, young scientists to show you what cutting edge science lies at the edge of human knowledge today, even here in your hometown, New Haven. And we want to tell you about how their world-class labs and their very own research and personal effort, their personal story, helps lay a siege on the edge of the known in our very hometown. We want to show you why research matters, how it will impact our daily lives, how is it done. But we want to do so from the perspective of the shoes that you could fill over coffee, snacks, and share the personal stories of how we got to where we are today and why we decided to devote our lives to this pursuit. What is our walk of life like? But then most importantly, we're not here to just talk to you. We're here to answer your questions. And so I encourage you to seek out all the people with name tags of graduate students and we'll break up into discussion groups after the presentations. There'll be three to four discussion groups, excuse me, three for each of the three speakers. So you can go and ask them questions vis-a-vis, face-to-face, one-on-one. And there'll be a fourth um, discussion group where we'll have the rest of the graduate students from different fields so we can represent a broader array of your interest. So without further ado, let me, let's begin. Let me introduce the, grad, the lineup of our students, graduate rock star students today. <laughs> so first, we'll zoom out from our seats here on Earth in this room and journey to the explosive surface of our burning sun, where Daryl Seligman, a young PhD scientist in the astronomy department back here on Earth at Yale, will take us on a tour of what goes on there through his stellar research in stellar astrophysics. <laughs> I had to take that one. <laughs> then, we will warp back in space, but not to Earth but to the difficult to assail land of our minds. And Sharif, a PhD in the Biology and Biomedical Sciences Department here back on Earth, will twist the fabric of our minds as he dives with us on a quest of the meaning of consciousness. Suddenly, we will find ourselves traveling not through space, but through time on a planet so unfamiliar, yet it will be revealed that in the secret past of our Earth, through the research of Robin Canavan, a PhD student back on Earth today in the geology department and geophysics department here at Yale. Whoops, too fast. <laughs> because the most valuable part, perhaps, of this whole thing will be after the talks. When you can ask your questions one-on-one -on -one with the speakers, and we'll have tags labeling each of the locations back there. And so we can continue to have a light snack, some coffee, and we'll break up into the groups with the three speakers and the graduate students back there by the tables. And so our quest does not end here, but it is only the beginning of your quest. 
And after the event, you can get in touch with any of the speakers so they can address any further questions you might have. Maybe even visit a lab one day. So thank you guys for being part of this. Thank you for taking time from your Sunday. Thank you Pathways and GPSS for funding. And let us begin our journey through space and time and meet Daryl on the surface of the sun. But first I have to tell you about Daryl. So Daryl sent me a bio, but I took the liberty to rewrite it. <laughs> Daryl. Daryl is a human earthling. As an Eagle Scout back on uh, Earth, he loves all outdoor oxygen activities. From backpacking to scuba diving, and most certainly sports. In high school, in the Philadelphia area, he um, wrestled, played football, and rugby. At the University of Pennsylvania, he double majored in physics and math. And now he has a first year PhD in the astronomy department. His, in, his research interests include, and here, here it goes, solar astrophysics, cosmology, specifically magnetohydrodynamics, helioseismology, gravitational lensing, and dark energy. You should try making that into a rap, Daryl. <laughs> and he will tell us what all these mean in his stellar astrophysics talk. Please help me welcome Daryl. So it goes from very passive to very active, back to passive. And so in 11 years, it's from passive to active. And we don't really, that's another thing, we really don't understand that at all. So I want to talk to you guys today about stellar astrophysics, or just more commonly known as the study of the stars. Uh, first though, I just want to say how inspiring it is to me that so many of you guys are here today, and you took your free time on a Sunday to come and learn about science from grad students, because it really reinforces this idea that I have, and this idea I've had has actually been proven to me over and over and over again throughout my life, and that's that people are fascinated by the universe, and people love science, and you know, it actually might be a little more fundamental than that. I think that as humans, we inherently have this drive to want to figure out what's happening in the universe and our place and kind of unravel the mysteries of the cosmos. So I don't think there was ever anyone who, it was a clear night and they went out and looked at the stars and saw the Milky Way and you know, they didn't wonder what the stars were and how they got there and what our place in the cosmos is, okay? And I'm not talking about just today. I'm talking about throughout time. So early, all throughout um, ancient civilizations, one constant is that all civilizations looked at the stars and made constellations. So they were looking at patterns in the stars and projecting what they saw in the natural world into the heavens. So one constellation that everyone knows is the Big Dipper. And this is a Greek constellation. The Greeks thought that the Big Dipper, or Ursa Major, was a bear. But the Egyptians actually thought that the Big Dipper looked like a hippopotamus. And so, okay, what was going on here? So they didn't have bears in Egypt, but they actually did have hippopotamus. So they were taking what they saw in the natural world and projecting that onto the stars. And what's so cool is that the other way around was also going on. So there's this theory that the three pyramids of Giza were actually built aligned with the three stars in Orion's belt. So, um, the sun was actually central to the Egyptians' religious belief. So, their main god was Ra, and Ra was the god of the sun, and he was the most powerful god in the Egyptian mythology. And depicted here is Ra on his boat, and every day, as the sun goes across the sky, Ra is supposed to be carrying the sun in his boat across the sky. And then at sunset, Ra goes into the underworld, and that's shown here. Ra is actually fighting the serpent Apep, who was, according to the Egyptians, the Lord of Chaos. And what's cool to me is that the reason that the sun is so central to their religion is it's central to their lives, right? Like their whole livelihood was based on the sun because their crops grew because of the sun. Um, yeah, and so there have been a lot of theories about stars throughout human history. I just want to this clip real quick. Here. Yeah. Ever wonder what those sparkling dots are up there? I don't wonder. I know. Well, what are they? They're fireflies. Fireflies.
realized it. They had got stuck up in that big bluish black thing. Oh, gee. I always thought they were balls of gas burning billions of miles away. With you, everything's gas. <laughs> so, but what's funny to me, actually, is that as little as Timon knows about the stars, we really aren't in that much of a better place right now. So we know very little about the stars. And it's kind of crazy to think, because if you think of the universe, in astronomical terms, the sun is one of the closest astronomical objects to us. But we really don't know that much about it. We, we know more than Timon, but... <laughs> so yeah, so Pumbaa's right, okay? These stars are these big balls of gas. But they're not passive. They're actually extremely active and volatile. And there are big solar eruptions that happen all the time. So it's like on Earth, there are volcanoes going off every couple of weeks. And they can be big solar flares or coronal mass ejections, which are basically a big explosion, and then the mass from the sun is ejected into space. And this is a video that was taken in 2000, April 2015 from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And they, it's a mass ejection they label the Phoenix Comets. So the video kind of speaks for itself. It's really awesome. But uh, watch here. There's going to be a big explosion. Um, here. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that we have the technology now to actually see it like this. But one thing I want to point out is that this was actually taken in extreme ultraviolet light. So this is really high energy light that you're watching, and you would not be able to see this with the naked eye. So actually, you see all these bright spots on the star? Um, those actually appear dark if you're looking in the visible light. And so the question is, what are these dark spots on the sun? So first in the 1600s, Galileo discovered that there were sunspots, and he observed th things like this. And scientists later discovered that these sunspots, that we now call them active regions, they have a lot of magnetic activity. And the magnetic activity makes the temperature go down. And so it shines less bright. So it's not that they don't shine, they just shine a lot less bright than the rest of the star. And now if you zoom into a sun, zoom into the sunspot, they actually come in these pairs. So it's, this is actually a north-south magnetic pair. And just like if you've ever had a bar magnet, or a couple of bar magnets, and the north and the south ends attract to each other, that's the same thing that's going on here. And scientists realize that it's these active regions that actually are associated with the big explosions. So the coronal mass ejections and the solar flares happen in these active regions. So they, they figured that the magnetic activity must be what was behind the solar flares. And there's this idea that they came up that this process that they observe, right? It's called magnetic reconnection. And here's a paper from 2015 of, this was before, during, and after the flare. And actually, these loops, the, the particles are frozen into the magnetic field. So you're actually seeing the magnetic field at the surface of the star. And the idea of magnetic reconnection is you have a big loop, and then it's in a really high energy state, and then these field lines break, and they reconfigure themselves in a lower energy configuration. But this energy has to go somewhere, so that's the energy that goes into the coronal mass ejection or the flare. So here, look, you've got a high energy state of the, twist of the magnetic fields, then it breaks here, and then it's a low energy state. And it's when it breaks there, that's when the flare happens. And another thing I want to stress is, even though I'm telling you about this, we really do not understand this process. So we see it happening, but we don't have a good grasp of the physics behind it. So it's a very active um, part of research right now. And it's a really exciting time because the National Solar Observatory is building a huge solar telescope in Hawaii. And we're going to be able to observe magnetic reconnection with much better resolution. And that's coming online in the next five years. So it's a really exciting time for solar physics. OK, so now with this in mind, I want to show you another coronal mass ejection. This happened in June of 2015. But I want you guys to watch for the magnetic re reconnection during the flare. So first, we just got a full disk view of it. Here's the flare, or the mass ejection. And now it's going to zoom in. And I want you guys to look at the field lines and look 
look at the high energy before the flare, then during, here's the high energy, right? So we've got the high energy configuration, it breaks, and now, well, wait for it, now we've got the big explosion, and we've got a lower energy configuration. So yeah, to me it's so cool that we have technology that we can watch this going on right now. So besides from the fact that it's really cool, why do we care about this? Like, why, are, why is the government funding people like me to do research on this? Well, the sun is actually one of the only astronomical objects that directly impacts our life on Earth. So every time there's a flare or a mass ejection, all of that mass and energy and magnetic flux, that's coming straight to Earth. And when that hits Earth, it messes with our GPSs, it messes with satellites, it messes with airplanes and power stations. Actually, it causes billions of dollars in damages every year. So the government really wants to find out the mechanisms behind the solar flares so that they can prevent these damages. Um, another reason that we want to study the sun is that we want to understand the properties of all of the stars in the universe. And there are tons of stars in the universe. And Stars are just like people. They're born, then they grow up, then they get old and they die. And the sun, our sun is a grown-up star. But we want to, by figuring out what's happening with the grown-up star, we want to extrapolate and figure out what's happening with all ages of stars. This is an exciting point, actually. Another reason we want to study it is a lot of astronomers now are looking for planets that are in other solar systems. So these are planets that orbit other stars. They call them exoplanets. And the, one of the ways in which you find an exoplanet is, so you, if you're observing the star, you look for the change in the light when the exoplanet passes in front of the star. And so, okay, say this projector is the star, and then my, my hand is the exoplanet. So you're watching, you see how much light is coming to the screen, and then this exoplanet goes by, and when it's in between us and the projector, there's less total light. Now, the issue is that, say you're looking at a star and it gets a sunspot, or it gets a solar flare. If the light is changing due to the star's activity, how do you distinguish that from the exoplanet? So this is one of the most active fields of research in astronomy today. Um, a third reason, a fourth reason is another application of how the sun affects life on Earth is every time there's a solar storm, it, it produces these beautiful auroras. And actually, there was a solar storm last week, and you could see auroras not that far north from here. And so, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening to me. Sharif loves to run. He enjoys leisurely runs throughout New Haven's beautiful parks. But don't be surprised if you see him zooming by. As an undergraduate, he was nationally ranked in the 800 meter and 8,000 meter runs. Along the way, he received a master's degree in cognitive neuroscience from the University College London and a bachelor's degree from Ohio Wesleyan University. Now, Sharif is a first year neuroscientist, neuroscience PhD student here at Back on Earth at Yale. He is most interested in studying consciousness and how people think using magnetics and electrodes. But I promise he wants that to give you with the <laughs> electrodes. He will tease our brain and explore depths that have seldom been reached. Please help me welcome Shari. How, how do you connect the neural activity with the conscious experience? So if that, that neuron that fires for pain is the only thing that's involved in you feeling pain, well, where is, where is the pain in the ion channels opening and that neuron activating? What is consciousness? This has been debated for literally thousands of years. But for our purposes, we'll say consciousness is two things. First, it's how something feels. And second, it's your ability to think about yourself other people, and the world. Now, over the course of these hundreds and thousands of years of people trying to figure out what is consciousness, where is consciousness, two competing positions have come into existence. And those two competing positions are materialist and dualist. 
but I'll tell you about them now. So we'll start with the materialist, or materialism. So the materialists tell us that consciousness is fundamentally a physical phenomenon. And in particular, it's something that happens in the brain. So your brain is making consciousness happen through the cells, the synapses, the activity, the talking that's going on between your uh, neurons in your head. Now, the opposing position, dualism, tells us something very different. It says that the universe is fundamentally two things. On the one hand, we have physical stuff, stuff that's made of matter, stuff that's made of atoms, molecules, cells, proteins, bricks, concrete, steel, things that you can see, that you can touch, that you can smell. But then there's this other piece of the universe which is not physical. They call it immaterial. It's not made of atoms. It's not made of matter. And they tell us that consciousness is fundamentally within this sphere of immaterial thing, the non-physical thing. So we have two competing positions. We have the materialist, consciousness is in the brain, and the dualist say that consciousness is a non-physical thing. It's an immaterial phenomenon. So what I'd like to do now is I want to challenge our view of these two opposing theories with the following uh, five theory. Mary, the color neuroscientist. Okay? A little story to tell you guys. So here's Mary. She's a brilliant neuroscientist who lives a few decades from now. And she knows everything there is to know about how color is processed in the brain. So she knows exactly about how photons of light enter your eye, reach the back of your eye, called the retina. The retina processes the information, brings it all together, it's sent down the optic nerve, goes all the way to the back of your brain, right back here, where the brain begins to process the vision uh, through various filters. So she knows every single step in this process. There is nothing more that Mary can learn about how color vision is processed in the brain. But, Here's the thing about Mary. She's never seen color before. She has a disease. She's completely colorblind, and not the male, green, uh, red colorblindness. She's never seen color at all. So she sees the world in black, white, and gray. But one day, with our fancy technology of the future, we're able to restore her color vision. So now she can see color. And let's say we present to Mary, we've just restored her color vision, and we have this beautiful red rose, and let's say we present that red rose in there. Okay? My question to all of you is, what will her reaction be when she sees that red rose? Does she look at that red rose in delight and surprise? Oh my goodness, I couldn't even imagine red could be so vibrant, red could be so pretty. Or... Does she look at that red rose, not surprised, sort of shrug her shoulders and say something like, duh, mm -hmm. I already knew what red would look like, even though I had never seen red before, because I knew exactly how red and all color is processed in the brain. So it's now your time to decide. Okay? She's surprised or she's not surprised. So show a hand for surprise when she sees that red rose. Okay, a little over half. Okay, show of hands for not surprised. Okay, okay, I like it. I like it. We've got some competing positions here. Very good. As I said, this has been a debate. So, not surprisingly, depending on your response, it tells us something important about that debate between the dualist and the materialist. So, for the two thirds of you that said she will be surprised, that's tantamount to saying that. Dualism is true and materialism is false. And the reason for that is if you remember, she knows everything there is to know about how color vision is processed in the brain. But that knowledge wasn't enough to tell her about the consciousness of color. And so what that tells us is that the consciousness part of it is outside of her knowledge and therefore outside of the physical world, the, the stuff that she knew. Now there's an additional implication to that. We can't really study consciousness fundamentally if this is true, because it's non-physical. 
We don't have the technology, nor I suppose we'll never have the technology to probe something that's non-physical, right? Now, if you said the exact opposite, about a third of you, she's not surprised, well, we have the opposite implication. So now, materialism is true, dualism is false. And again, the reason for this is her knowledge of color vision and how it's processed in the brain was all she needed to know to tell her about the consciousness of color. And the, the additional uh, implication is that we can study consciousness because it's a physical thing. It's a brain thing. Now, personally, I am a passionate do uh, materialist. <laughs> materialist. And as a materialist, one of the things I'm interested in doing is studying how consciousness is processed in the brain. And so let's get back to the original question I was uh, presenting, which is where is consciousness in the brain? And this is something that I'm very interested in studying. And there's really two theories on where it might be in the brain. And here's the first. So the first theory says that consciousness is in one place in the brain. So there's one special place where all the information in your brain sort of comes together, and that place in the brain turns it into a conscious experience. Theory two says something different. It says that lots of different places in your brain are being involved in consciousness. So it's a collaborative effort. Various places in the brain are working together to make you conscious. Okay? Now, the reason why answering this question is so important, it's not only just for curiosity, it's not only for solving a debate that's been going on for literally 3,000, 4,000 years, but there are people who have unusual conscious states. And here are a few examples of those clinical populations. People with epilepsy, people who are in minimal or vegetative states, and people who have locked-in syndrome. And there's many more that I'm not listing here. And with a better knowledge of how consciousness works and where it is, we might be able to treat these populations much better than we do today. So let's move on now and talk about some of the research I'm doing at Yale uh, in the lab of Dr. Hal Blumenfeld, who's been studying this topic for quite some time. So we're using this special technique called EEG. Okay? So here I am with an EEG device on my head and all these wires and electrodes are coming out. And this is how it works. So your brain is constantly talking to itself. There's all these cells, about 10 billion of them, and they're all talking to one another. And one of the ways they talk is with electrical signals. And sometimes those electrical signals sort of leak out of your head. And what we're able to do with EEG in these electrodes is we're able to capture those leaking signals. And actually, good news for us, is those signals tell us a lot about what's happening inside your head. So we have subjects who we put this EEG device on their head, and then we have them complete a consciousness test. So this is how this test works. So we show them a computer screen, nothing on it as first, and then a few moments later, a face pops up, and then we ask them, did you see the face? Okay? But here's the thing, the face flashes very quickly. So about half the time, they say, nope, didn't see the face, and the other half of the time, they say, yeah, I saw the face. So essentially, half the time they're conscious of the face, and the other half of the time they're not. And what we're interested in doing is understanding how the brain activity differs between those two states, the conscious state and the unconscious state. So let's look at some results. So when our subjects say, nope, didn't see the face, they're not conscious, this is what we see. We see activity just in the back of the brain in a place called the occipital lobe, or the primary visual cortex. So this is the part of the brain that deals with color, I'm sorry, with vision and also can do things like that as well, but just vision in general. And this makes sense because we're asking them to do a visual task. They're at, sitting there and they're looking, and so we expect to see activity in the back of the brain, but that's all we see. But now, when they are conscious of the face, we see something different. So we first see activity beginning back in the, that visual area again, and then a few moments later, it hops a little forward, then it jumps all the way to sort of the top front of the brain, and then finally ends in moving uh, to the bottom front of the brain here. So what we're seeing when someone says they're conscious 
is this dynamic motion and movement of activity across the brain. And so now let's go back to those two theories that we were initially talking about. So remember, theory one says consciousness is one place in the brain, and theory two says consciousness is a collaborative effort. It's occurring across various brain networks. So again, I'm going to have you show your hands for theory one based off of our evidence. Oh, no one. Okay. Theory two. Who supports theory two? Okay, so that's really where we're thinking uh, this research is, is going down. And, and there been previous research has showed this is also seems to be a case. Lots of parts of the brain are being involved in producing a conscious state. Now this is how I would like to end today, which is, I need your help, okay? This is a challenging subject. And people, the smartest people, who have lived for hundreds of years, have attempted to answer some of the questions we talked about today. And it still remains a profound mystery, perhaps the greatest mystery. So I need all of you who are interested to become neuroscientists, become psychologists, and even philosophers. They have a role to play. And so we can come together and work on solving these issues. And perhaps if we're all on the same page, we're all doing the same type of research, we can be the last generation to say that consciousness was a mystery. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Robin Lustiking. Canoeing, camping, and, uh, and is often staring at rocks on the ground instead of the scenery around her. Her work allows her to combine a love of nature with a curious mind. She got a master's degree at the University of Wyoming, also in geology and geophysics, where she studies the uh, uplift history of the high Andes mountains. Robin is a graduate student here at Yale, back on Earth, in the department of geology and geophysics at Yale. She focuses, or rather uses a technique called clump isotope paleothermometry to estimate past temperatures during greenhouse climates at a time when there was little to no ice on Earth, on Earth's poles. Outside lab, her dream is to encourage other young scientists, those who have ever collected seashells or made baking soda volcanoes, to get even more excited about the natural and physical sciences. Today, she will guide us on a tour through time of Earth's vast and rich history in science and its origins. Please help me welcome Robin. You're, you're fine if, if all your high school offers you is biology and chemistry and physics, because you're going to need that for sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin. I am a geochemist, and I study paleoclimates. So that means I look at the chemical signature of rocks and fossils and try to better understand the Earth's climate through its long history. So before we delve into the rock record, though, and try to understand the mysteries of our past Earth, I want us to take a moment to just visit our current Earth. This is an image of Hurricane Joaquin that hit in October 2nd of this year. And as you can see, it's taken from the International Space Station. And as you can see, this is familiar. There's cities in the distance. We live in these cities. There's the storm forming off the Atlantic Ocean that we all know here in New Haven, right out our front door. The continents at this time, we know this map. We see it in our history books, in our geographic books. And there's ice at the poles, like Zach was saying. Now, the Earth of the past looked very different, and looked very different at different time periods. Very different from what it looks like today. What did the Earth look like in its humble beginnings? Well, not that different from a bunch of other rocks zooming around the solar system at the time. Two of those such rocks, the Proto-Earth and the Proto-Moon, collided violently 4.5 billion years ago producing a mass that spewed out, and gravity did the work after this violent collision of selling all the densest material to the Earth's core. The least dense became the Earth's crust, and all of that material that was ejected out from this collision consolidated in orbit around the Earth and became the moon. Now, we can get an age of this collision, but unfortunately not from any rock material on Earth. Due to the conveyor boat 
conveyor belt motions of the Earth's crust. Um, tectonic plates override each other and then sink below each other. So a lot of Earth's oldest crust, the record of that is erased. So how do we actually know the age of this collision? We study lunar rocks. One of the ways we can do that is using a tool called radiometric dating. Now, when rocks or minerals crystallize, they basically set their chemical signature, except for radioactive elements. Radioactive elements like uranium decay at a known rate to lead, and thus we can look at, say, this uh, moon rock from the Apollo missions, which is rich in uranium, and look at the ratio of uranium to lead to estimate its age. So based on uranium lead dating of lunar rocks, we know that the Earth-Moon impact, and thus the formation of the Earth, was 4.5 billion years. Now that is a big number to kind of grapple with and picture. So to help demonstrate that, I would like to ask for two volunteers from the audience to come up here and help me, if you would. would you, people want to raise their hands? Yep, come on up. Another volunteer? Yeah, come on up. So I will ask you to stand over here. If you can take this end. If you want to come here, grab this purple end. And take this and just walk that way. Watch where you're going now. <laughs> keep going, keep going. So this is a scarf that a student knit for me actually, but the length of this scarf represents 4.5 billion years, total length. So we have the Earth-Moon impact right here at this end, this fringe. And all the way down here on this ribbon, we have, almost by the purple fringe on the other end, the evolution of humans. So that's a lot of time. This is what we call, what geologists call, deep time. It's a lot. <laughs> And for those of us who, like myself, were obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid, this ribbon right here is the evolution of the first dinosaurs. It's not really a lot of time between those two when you look at the whole history of the Earth. And if you keep going all the way back in time, somewhere around here, you have the oldest fossils ever, the oldest evidence of life. So. There's a lot of time in between and a lot of in in interesting periods in which Earth looked very different. So thank you ladies for helping out. We can just uh, wrap this back up. So to go back to Earth's early beginnings, right before, um, right when we had the first sign of life, this is what Earth would have looked like. The Earth was 30% less bright than it is, or the sun, sorry, was 30% less bright than it is today, suggesting it would have been a lot colder. But the rock record shows evidence of marine sediments, suggesting that there was liquid water then. Now, scientists think this is due to much higher concentrations of greenhouse gases, which makes sense because Earth's internal engine was churning much more back then, so we would have had a lot of volcanism, which is why there's volcanoes back here in the distance. Now, those marine sediments um, from this ancient time period show evidence of reduced forms of iron and sulfur, suggesting that there was little to no oxygen on the planet. So you and I would have not survived. This would not have been a happy place for us to live in. And in fact, most of the critters had some other way of making their living back then. That is until about 3.5 billion years ago, when the first photosynthetic organism evolved. These guys, blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, lived in these maps, which you can see here, called stromatolites. And the evidence for them um, spewing out oxygen, basically as a waste product of photosynthesis, comes in what we call banded iron formations. This qualitative evidence of the oxygenation of Earth's atmosphere shows dark bands of anoxic iron, reduced iron, and oxic bands of red iron, showing how this um, slow process of oxygenating Earth's atmosphere was happening. So unfortunately, oxygen poisoned everything back then, but it was great for us, right? And everything that came before it, after it, dinosaurs included. 
Now, this qualitative evidence of the rock rec record is commonly used by paleoclimatologists. Another example is a drop stone here, this angular boulder that fell in really finely laminated beds of uh, marine sediments, as well as this poorly sorted glacial till here. These are both geological rocks that are produced by glaciers and were found in low latitudes about 600 million years ago, suggesting that glaciers from the poles move all the way to the tropics during this time period. This has become a period well known by geologists and earth scientists as Snowball Earth. Um, and that's pictured here in a cartoon. You can see this process is started by what we call a positive feedback loop. So you have ice form at the high poles. It's bright, it's light colored, it reflects solar radiation, which cools the earth, which builds more ice, and so on and so forth, until you have a sort of runaway ice house. So how do we get out of this? If we're a giant snowball, why are we here? Why is life here? Well, the earth is still turning. The insides, molten rock is still moving around, and eventually volcanoes kick in, spew out a bunch of dust and soot and CO2, a greenhouse gas, and that soot covers the ice, making it darker, allowing more radiation to absorb on the surface, and melts the ice, and you have that positive feedback loop going in the opposite direction. CO2, as well as a greenhouse gas, warms the atmosphere. So that is how we got out of it. Now, paleoclimatologists like myself can also use quantitative tools such as stable isotope geochemistry in addition to the rock record to better understand past climates. One of those tools that we use is stable isotopes. These, unlike the radiogenic isotopes, uranium and lead, that we use for dating, they do not decay. They simply differ on their mass. So for example, oxygen has isotopes, stable isotopes. So oxygen in seawater can either have the common oxygen-16 with eight protons and eight neutrons, or it can have the rarer version flavor of oxygen with eight protons and 10 neutrons, oxygen-18, those uh, spinning cartoons up here. So they simply differ on mass, and because it is easier to evaporate a lighter isotope than a heavier isotope, water vapor, precipitation, and snow is more abundant in oxygen-16 than the seawater from which it evaporated. So during cold time periods, depicted down here, ice traps more 16O on the continent, and so seawater during cold time periods is heavier, meaning it has more oxygen-18 than in seawater in warmer climates. So we can use this phenomenon and look at fossils, including these cute little critters, Benthic foraminifera here, which are these tiny single-celled organisms that live um, in the deep ocean. And because they grow their shells in seawater, they incorporate oxygen from that seawater into their calcium carbonate shells. We can grind them up, dissolve them, basically destroy them, and um, get a record of temperature. Because the ratio of 18O to 16O is temperature dependent, we can develop things called oxygen isotope temperature <coughs> curves, like this one here. This is for the time period of the late Cretaceous, when dinosaurs are roaming the planet. And as you can see, um, at the peak of warming, based on oxygen isotopes, the global mean annual temperatures were 10 to 18 degrees C warmer than they are today. Today is about 14. So what did it look like, actually? 10 to 18 degrees C warmer than it is today, very different. You can kind of see continent outlines that look like today, but what's striking, especially for those of us in the US, is that there is a shallow tropical intercontinental seaway that stretches from the Arctic to the Gulf. This is because there's no ice cliff poles and sea level is much higher. In addition, because it was so much warmer, the tropical belt was expanded, we actually have alligator fossils in Alaska. <laughs> They don't do so well today. <laughs> so this is what we call a greenhouse climate. The levels of greenhouse gases are much higher during the late Cretaceous. Another example of a greenhouse climate is what we call the Eocene about 50 million years ago. So after the age of the dinosaurs, this is when mammals are evolving. Looks more like today, except we don't have the Himalayan mountains yet. The Isthmus of Panama has not formed, and we still have no ice at the poles. 
We think based on other geochemical proxies and that suggest levels of CO2 that they were around 500 to 1,500 parts per million. That is compared to the pre-industrial levels of CO2 before the Industrial Revolution, around 280 parts per million CO2. So because of those higher levels of greenhouse gases, the planet was much warmer. It was a lush tropical world. It might have looked something like this where mammals were evolving. These are actually early horse ancestors that were about the size of dogs <laughs> that lived back then. Um, so, you know, these are fascinating time periods that we all study. It's great to study paleoclimates just because they're really interesting and totally different from the way the world looks today. But one of the other important reasons scientists are interested in studying paleoclimates is because by studying the past and how the Earth reacted, to increase greenhouse gases, we can better understand how the Earth will react, will react in the future to human emissions of CO2. Now this past year, we have hit a landmark level of around 400 parts per million CO2 compared to that 280 pre-industrial level. And here are some projections of um, Earth's temperature change compared to today for the future, 2050, 2100. Now, that, that level of 400 parts per million hasn't been that high since the Pliocene, around 4 million years ago, when the Earth's average temperatures were 2 to 4 degrees C warmer than today. Another time period that's commonly studied by paleoclimatologists is the paleocene eocene thermal maximum. You can see here a rapid warming event. That rapid warming the increase of greenhouse gases at that time that caused it is around the, the scale that is happening now due to humans. So what's really important, not just for curiosity reasons, although that is what got me into it initially, was finding fossils on camping trips and going to museums, is that we can use the past of Earth's climate to better inform policy and make plans so that our society is prepared for when the world we know of today becomes the Earth of tomorrow. So with that, I'll take any questions.